from the Gospel of Matthew, from the sixth chapter, verses 24 through 34, here we hear these words. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate one, hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was never clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive for <coughs> excuse me, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May God add God's blessing to our hearing and to our understanding. Let us pray. Most gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. And, O God, may your word indeed be a light unto the paths of our lives. And on this day, as I arose, once again you granted me the ability to speak. I pray now that you grant me the wisdom to preach. For we gather and we pray these things in the name of your Son and our Savior, And we all say, Amen. Amen. We read this morning's scripture and we say, exactly. This is the way we should all live our lives. The first verse, you cannot serve two masters, God and wealth, check. The second verse, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your body, what you will wear, check. The last verse, today's trouble is enough for today. (laughs) Big check. And that next to last verse, it provides the lyrics to one of the all-time great camp songs that we teach our kids for them to begin to understand the importance of a life of faith. They sing, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. And that verse, taken in isolation, can be badly misread. Trust God, ask for what you want, and you will get it, seems to be our first response to it. The prosperity gospel especially promises millions of people who gather in stadiums each year and TV viewers around the world that all we have to have as a Christian people is sufficient trust sufficient faith, and that will bring a desired reward. So much of that prosperity gospel is built upon what we have been saying to each other and our children 
for generations. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Work long and hard. Always do your best. And just put your nose to the grindstone and move forward. Edwin Freeman, a Jewish rabbi and a counselor, was one to say, you know, the only thing you get when you put your nose to the grindstone is a flat face. (laughs) Those of us gathered here this morning have lived long enough in our lives to know even though we endeavor to do all those things, There is no guarantee of success. Does hard work help? Absolutely. Does it guarantee success? Everyone here already knows that it does not. Deep in our souls, there is a seed planted that understands whether it is in this church or this community, this city or this state, this nation or this world, until opportunity is equal, there is no chance for equal outcomes. Are there exceptions? Absolutely. And we cherish them and we celebrate them (coughs) when those stories are told. But still we understand equality does not happen until opportunity is equal. So many of us gathered here this day, we worry for the first 65 years of our lives about acquiring and getting more and stashing enough aside. And then we worry for the last 10 or 20 years, will we have enough to make it to the end of our lives? And so many others in this world, even in our community, are like the people who worry almost solely about sustenance. Will there be enough to eat, to drink, to sustain my life, the life of my family, the life of my children? Mark Chernoff wrote in a post on the website Live, Learn, Evolve about 10 painfully obvious truths truths everyone forgets too soon. They seem to me to be good first steps in endeavoring to answer Jesus' call of don't worry about our lives or what we will eat or what we will drink about our bodies or what what we will wear. First, he writes, the average human life is relatively short. Live your life today. Don't ignore death, but don't be afraid of it either. Be afraid of a life you've never lived because you were afraid to take action. Death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is in what dies inside you while you're still alive. Be bold. Let us be courageous. Let us be scared today and then take the next step anyway. Secondly, you will only ever live the life that you create for yourself. Your life is yours alone. Others can try to persuade you, but they can't decide for you. They can walk with you, but not in your shoes. So make sure the path you decide to walk aligns with your own intuition and your own gifts and graces for ministry. And don't be scared. As individuals or us as church, don't be scared to switch paths or to even pave a new one when it makes sense in our life and history. And if life teaches you one thing, let it be that taking a passionate leap is always worth it. Ask yourself this question. Does it ever get boring living on this side of the edge? Even if you have no idea where you're going to land. Let us once in a while be brave enough to step up to the edge of the unknown and to listen to our hearts and then live it. Third, being busy does not mean being productive. Oh my God. 
blasphemy from the pulpit. <laughs> Though being busy can make us feel more alive than anything else for a moment, the, sus- the sensation is not sustainable long term. We will inevitably weather, whether tomorrow or on our deathbed, come to wish that we spent less time in the buzz of busyness and more time actually living a purposeful life. Fourth, some kind of failure always occurs before success. It's okay, this is a light day, we can laugh. Okay, loosen up. Most mistakes are unavoidable. Learn to forgive yourself. It's not a problem to make them. It's only a problem if you never learn from them. Bottom line is, Nathan, bottom line is, there we go. Just because it's not happening now doesn't mean it never will. Sometimes things have to go very wrong before they can go very right. Fifth, thinking and doing are two very different things. You can't read the print. It says, I think I'm going to go run in Papillona. (laughs) Kind of has to make a round. I got it. Everybody gets it. What are we to do? Not what we say we will do, but what we do. Good things don't come to those who wait, we know that. They come to those who work on meaningful goals. Ask yourself, what's really important? And then as individuals, and again as church, then we have to have the courage to build our lives around the answer to that question. Six, you don't have to wait for an apology to forgive. Life gets much easier when we learn to accept all the apologies we never get. Forgiveness is a promise, one we want to keep. When we forgive someone, we are making a promise not to hold the unchangeable past against our present self. It has nothing to do with freeing a criminal of his or her crime. It has nothing to do with staying in an abusive marriage, relationship, or friendship. And it has everything to do with freeing ourselves of the burden of being a victim in this world. Seven, sometimes some people are simply the wrong match for us, for you. You will only ever be as great as the people you surround yourself with. We tell our children that every day. So let all of us be brave enough to let go of those who keep bringing us down. Don't force connections with people who constantly make you feel less than amazing. It makes no sense to force it with people who are the wrong match for you. Eighth. It's not the other person's job to love you, it's yours. Today, let someone love you just the way you are, as flawed as you might be, as unattractive as you sometimes feel, and as incomplete as you think you are. Yes, let someone love you despite all of this, and let that someone be you. For we only love our neighbor as well as we love ourselves. Nine, what we own is not who we are. Stuff in the end is just stuff, and it has absolutely no bearing on who you or I am as a person. Most of us can make do with much less than we think that we need. Here's what we need to do. Walk through your home. Let us walk through our homes and let us check our definition of necessity and luxury in our lives. That becomes a valuable reminder that we are called to seek out meaningful connections 
and meaningful experiences to live out and share in our lives. And tenth, are you ready for this final one? Embrace change and realize it happens for a reason. It won't always be obvious at first, but in the end, it will be worth it. Sometimes the shortest split second in time changes the direction of our lives. That seemingly innocuous decision rattles our whole world like a meteorite striking the earth. The three seconds it takes for us to cross a room, to pick up a ringing phone, and to listen, life is turned upside down. For better or worse, on the strength of an unpredictable event. And these events we know are always happening. Let us look for reasons to integrate change into our lives and not for reasons to push it away. And so on this Sunday morning of fun, we gather to listen And my question to you is, what else would you add to this list? What important life lessons do you forget? Susie and I read this list together, and then we had a conversation about it, and we added three. The first was, don't lose your perspective. The second was, it takes less energy to love than to hate. And our final one was, life is so much more kind and gentle when we live compassionately than endeavoring to feed revenge. Struggling to make sense in a worry-filled world. Rich and poor, free and slave, people of all shapes and sizes and skin tones across ethical, eth- ethnic lines and across every cultural line, what we share in common as human beings is we worry. And as much as we think that it is a basic part of life, essential to our living, required to be sharp, vital for completion. When we turn around and ask Jesus, Jesus, don't you understand why we do this? Jesus looks at us and says what? No, I don't. Today's problems are enough for today. Check. Epiphany ends today. Lent is about to begin on Wednesday. Fear not, for God is with us. Seek first ye the kingdom of God, and God will provide you and First Christian Church Lubbock and all of creation with all we need to do ministry, not tomorrow or next week, but to do ministry today. Check. And all God's people gathered, and all God's people had the opportunity to hear, and all God's people said, and all God's people said, and all God's people said,